I've noticed a pattern that's developed in me with each game that I play. I always pick a certain type of character as my favorite. It's odd though, because it's never the hero or the villain, like many people might assume, or choose themselves. I'm the kind of guy who likes the sidekicks. I guess that's the role that's most relatable to me. You know, the trusty companion who always has the good guy's back. The badass who doesn't always get the spotlight. Even in television, I absolutely love Jesse from Breaking Bad and Glenn from The Walking Dead. Because I love this kind of character so much, I've decided to pick the top 10 sidekicks in gaming. Of course, this is limited to games I've played, I'm sure there are tons of sidekicks I'm missing or never heard of, and I'd love to see your suggestions below. For variety, I'm going to have one sidekick per series. With that, I think we should kick it off with number 10. At first, delving into the Aperture Science Labs and Portal seemed like a harmless experience. But, once the novelty of the portal gun starts to wear off, you start to notice the exasperated writing on the wall and the introduction of deadly aspects to the puzzles. That helpless feeling slowly starts to sink in. With the only company being GLaDOS's condescending comments, Here come the test results. You are a horrible person. You can't help but get a little lonely. Then, all of a sudden, you get this cube! And it has a heart on it! And you take it with you, and you love it, because it's your cube! I've decided to start off this list with a bit of an unconventional choice. The companion cube. Despite its inanimateness, many players, including myself, fell in love with the companion cube instantly. It's become really popular and developed into an icon of the Portal series. But when you're forced to part ways with this cube by incineration, it's truly devastating. Your one friend in this cruel world, gone for the sake of progression. The sake of science. And it sucks. Goodbye, old friend. When the world goes to hell, and zombies are freaking everywhere, going out in the world as a lone wolf isn't going to get you far. You need friends, and what better friends than four badasses shooting and exploding their way from safe house to safe house. If you don't know who I'm talking about by now, I'd like to introduce you to the survivors of Left 4 Dead. I'm talking about the original four, Francis, Zoe, Lewis, and Bill. I'm technically breaking the rules again, since this is a cooperative group rather than a protagonist with sidekicks, but I'd like to think that I make the rules here. They've got your back, and that's what matters. Actually, the NPCs don't always have your back. They might have been higher up on this list if that wasn't the case. Anyways, you've seen us play this game on our channel, so you know how much we love it. What I like about it most is how the stories of the characters are told through in-game dialogue, not through cutscenes. It's such an original way to develop our understanding of such cool and mysterious people. They're freaking awesome, and I proudly award them the number 9 spot. Initially, I was extremely skeptical of the Fallout series. I bought New Vegas on the Steam Summer Sale last year, and the first few hours did nothing to win me over. I thought the layout was clunky and hard to control, the graphics were just okay, and everything just took so long. But then I got out into the world, and I turned on the radio. Let me tell you, this game has a little thing called atmosphere executed perfectly. Sitting at my desk after dinner, I had never felt so immersed in a game. I was so relaxed and so comfortable listening to Mr. New Vegas and classic music as I explored post-apocalyptic America. I really started to appreciate the world of Fallout and its diverse inhabitants, and with me along the entire experience was my trusty old Pip-Boy. I know they actually have companions in Fallout 3 and New Vegas, with Boone being my favorite, but the Pip-Boy actually gives you a sense of organization, purpose, immersion, and with VATS, security. It's with you for the entire journey, and it never fails to do its job. That's why I love it. Short and sweet for that one. And I know it's not an actual living thing. I'll start to actually have some of those now. Call of Duty. Oh, Call of Duty. I have an issue with this series. I never would have strayed away from Nintendo if I hadn't discovered these games. Looking back, I generally would have been better off without these time-sucking, rage-inducing games. I was the annoying prepubescent 12-year-old online that every gamer hates, and I blame myself for it completely. I strayed away from my Nintendo roots. I should have stayed playing those harmless, time-sucking, and range-inducing games. I'm a hypocrite, whatever! In all seriousness, there's a game coming up later in the countdown that's the deciding factor in why Nintendo is without a doubt my favorite game company. Now back to what I'm supposed to be talking about. Despite the fact that I now have a silent hatred for this series, for obvious reasons, I absolutely love, and actually still love, Call of Duty 4. The series fell apart for me after that game. I'm not going to talk much about the multiplayer, which was solid, because the single player campaign was insane. The story had depth, 
the cutscenes were moving, and best of all, the characters were so awesome. Captain Price, Nikolai, Vasquez and Griggs, the Scott in the ghillie suit, and all those dastardly bad guys. You get to play as a dude named Soap for God's sake. No one could top my favorite though, Gaz. Quite possibly the most badass on this list, Gaz could just not be left out. Something about him, maybe it's his dialogue, his name, or his hat, it just draws me in, even more than Captain Price and Ghost from Modern Warfare 2, which are both popular choices. It sure was a slap in the face when he died. Right at the end, too. It was sad! You know what's cool in a game? Control. And, just like Atmosphere, Bethesda knows how to get this stuff down and execute it well. This time, I'm talking about the insanely addictive and immersive Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim. You don't even have to play the main quest, ever. Which you probably should a little bit, but you don't have to. You can seriously just blow off the guy who just, I don't know, saved your life and go do side quests and join guilds and freaking walk in nature if you want to. It's all a blast. You get to be whoever you want, kill people with whatever you want, and you can even marry whoever you want. Wait, you're telling me you can only marry a select group of people? You know what? Good enough! Best of all, you can pick from a slew of trusty companions to accompany you on your journey through Skyrim. My partner of choice is, without a doubt, Mjol the Lioness. What? Not Lydia? Yeah, not Lydia. She may have been my first companion, but she got killed by a dragon and I didn't even notice her absence until I reached the throat of the world. Oops! Yet, upon traveling to Riften, I come across this mysterious, intimidating lady and I learn the story about her lost blade, Grimseaver. And I go on an awesome quest to get her sick blade, found deep inside the Dwarven ruins. I'm under the impression that this woman eats nails for breakfast, without any milk. I would like that on my side, thank you very much. Once you have her for a companion, she's very reliable, especially if you deck her out in dragonbone armor like I did. Oh yeah, did I mention she likes wielding staffs too? Your Lydia argument is invalid. Hey guys, it's Jacob here, now to relieve you from the terrible and seemingly incessant voice of Dominic. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm really here just to tell you guys about this exciting sidekick, because Dominic has yet to play the game that this character is featured in. So anyway, one thing I think helps make a game well crafted is when the companion you work with through the game is not a person you just drag along, but someone who drags you along at points. A perfect example of this can be found in the third installment of the Bioshock series, Bioshock Infinite. I have just recently completed the game, and while playing came to appreciate the companionship of my sidekick in the game, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a very interesting character with a unique story that you can't compare to other sidekicks. You just don't find women very often that have been unknowingly protected from you by a huge flying beast their entire lives while living in a gigantic tower. Unless you're Booker DeWitt. But you aren't, so STOP LYING! Elizabeth's story is just the beginning of why she makes a great sidekick. Like I said, Elizabeth is not some helpless woman that you drag around. Oftentimes, she is the one helping you through the story with her special abilities that I don't want to tell you about yet because I don't want to spoil it. But uh, this makes Elizabeth seem more like an equal to you rather than just extra luggage. Her leadership also makes the game less predictable since at points only she knows what to do next and you don't know what's coming. In addition to her unique story and unmatched leadership, she gives you helpful items throughout the game that actually are helpful. In some games you might find a companion that gives you some random crap you don't need, but Elizabeth is that amazingly helpful sidekick that saves your ass by giving you extra shotgun shells when your bullets run dry. So for her story, leadership, and actual helpfulness, Elizabeth earned herself the number 5 spot on the list. Doomsday. Borderlands 2 is by far the most f***ing insane game that I have ever played. Although, I admit, I've never played any of that cluster f***ing Katamari series. The writers at 2K were certainly drinking their happy juice when they made the script for this game. Because of this, I'm gonna let the footage do most of the talking here, because frankly, what it has to say is a bit more interesting than what I have to say. Here are some of my favorite scenes. Shoot me in the face! In the face! Do it! Shoot me in the face! Face, 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 face! Now! Bullets in the face! Thank you! That's what I wanted to see. Unfortunately, you're fired, because Dino's recovered enough to get back on his roof. I haven't recovered. You just duct taped my legs to these pogo sticks. Borderlands 2 is funny, the gameplay is fluid and easy to jump right into, the weapons are awesome, and best of all, the characters are so unique. You just love to hate the main antagonist, Handsome Jack. He's just such a dick, and he knows it too. The good guys have some colorful characters as well, but none match up to number 4 on this list. 
That's right folks, it's the CL4P-TP General Purpose Robot, better known as Claptrap. A bit of a disclaimer here, I have in fact played the first Borderlands, but I feel that Claptrap was executed a bit better in its successor. Claptrap saves you from an icy grave at the start of the game, and sticks with you for the first half hour or so. He's really only your companion for that long, but he continues to reappear throughout the duration of the game. I really don't think words will do him justice, so I'm going to show you some of his best moments. Even without my explanation, you'll certainly see what makes him so awesome. This is it, minion! Our vengeance is finally on hand! Let's tear this planet a new goal! Yeah! I am the last Additional door defenses. Turrets deployed. Sorry about the mess. Everything Jack kills, he dumps here. Bandits, vault hunters, claptrap units. If I sound pleased about this, it's only because my programmers made this my default tone of voice. I'm actually quite depressed. Before I even knew that I liked role-playing games, I played Pokemon. My first Pokemon game was Emerald of Generation 3, when I was around 7 years old. I didn't exactly realize the strategy behind the games, so I just bulked up my mudkip to around level 90 and destroyed every gym that I faced. I enjoyed the game without understanding that speed determines who goes first, the concept of type effectiveness, and having a balanced team. You know, just about everything. The reason I loved this game so much was because of the Pokemon themselves. It seemed so cool as a kid, and maybe even today, as a grown-up, to have a Pokemon in real life. I tend to kind of place myself into games, most notably in this one, to get the most out of the experience. You know, picturing myself as a trainer roaming Kanto, Johto, and Hoenn, discovering creatures I had never seen before with trusted and lovable friends at my side. And this was certainly the case. I only have a new Pokemon from the Generation 1 anime, and we didn't even have internet on my old Windows 98 desktop until I was about 6. I always thought that was the coolest thing about gaming as a kid. Since I didn't have the internet to guide me, I went completely blindly into games, never looking up how to find things or spoiling things for myself. Looking back, I realized that's how games are meant to be played, and that's what made them so enchanting. It seems I've gone off on a tangent, but I think you understand. Pokemon's able to draw nostalgic feelings out of a 15-year-old. Impressive work, Nintendo. Now I feel old and sad. Mario might as well be the most iconic video game hero of all time. Some might even call him the best. He's the face of Nintendo, and has appeared in over 200 games, more than any other character in history. That's insane. But he never really did it for me. I know, I seem to be dropping impossible statements like dimes, but I have my reasons. I always loved his awkward little brother more. Maybe I sympathize with the fact that Luigi has only starred in a handful of games and has been harshly neglected throughout the years. Maybe it's because I relate to his small, clumsy demeanor. Whatever it is, Luigi has always been my favorite plumber, ever since my first GameCube game, Mario Kart Double Dash. You all know Luigi, not much else needs to be said. Just know he's one of the most recognized sidekicks of all time, and I love him. Now folks, prepare yourself for number one. Before that, we'd like to give you our honorable mentions, people who either missed the cutoff or were in games that we never played before. These include Kazooie, Clank, Daxter, Tails, either Atlas or Peabody, Slippy the Toad, and Otacon. You aren't expecting this character. I'm sure of it. This character is number one solely because of my experiences as a kid. Everyone has their Legend of Zelda game, right? For most, it's Ocarina of Time, but generally it's the one that a person remembers the most, the one that gives him or her the most fond or nostalgic memories. That's what the deal is for most Nintendo fans, at least. Unfortunately, my gaming glory years as a young kid were from about 2005 to 2009. That was before I made the disastrous switch to Call of Duty at around age 12. What's even more disastrous than that was the fact that those years were when the Wii was in full swing. As a result, a lot of the games I played were not the greatest. But, there was one diamond in the rough, I think, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Many people think this game is a blatant copy of Ocarina of Time, but as a kid, that didn't matter to me. I didn't even know what Ocarina of Time was, and I knew even less about the Zelda series as a whole. This was my first Zelda game, and it was so cool! It made me feel like a hero, like all of Link's accomplishments were mine. What's interesting, though, is that Link's story arc isn't the only important one in the game. The fact is, there's another character that accompanies you throughout the entire journey with a complete story of her own. This character is Minda. She has to be my favorite side character in the entire Zelda series, and is by far the best of the companions. 
Don't get me started on certain other companions. Midna is the epitome of Nintendo's dark side. She was forcibly dethroned in the realm of Twilight by Zant, one of her own people, deprived of her magic, and transformed into an imp. This form is the one in which Midna accompanies the player throughout the game, so it's the most recognizable one. Midna's goal is to return to her world and restore peace, but she needs Link to help, since she is helpless without her power. On the other hand, Link is tasked with restoring himself back from wolf to human form, as well as completing some much greater tasks in the future. Therefore, Midna and Link are helping each other out, but for their own purposes. It has to be one of the most fleshed out and interesting companionships that I've ever experienced in a game. And looking back, it's still as cool as it was seven years ago. For that reason, Midna is my number one top sidekick.